Hello there, fellow cultists. This is DM Nell, and I'm back with another episode of Soddle Talk. And I can already hear your 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 cries of anger and betrayal. How the hell could I be doing a Soddle Talk episode while wearing a D and D shirt? Well, I got to tell you, um, it's by design, uh, and that's because the theme of this episode is. How to make your D&D game more like Shadow of the Demon Lord. Now, I wanted to tackle this one, and I think I touched on it a little bit in a previous video, but I wanted to really do a deep dive on this because um, there are probably many of you out there who don't only uh, run Shadow of the Demon Lord games, you also run D&D games or some other role-playing game. Or perhaps you want to run Shadow of the Demon Lord, but you can't talk your players into actually playing Shadow of the Demon Lord or, or switching your D&D game over to Shadow of the Demon Lord. So I was, I'm fortunate. I have two groups, and one group, I do Shadow of the Demon Lord. That's my Tuesday night group. And then my other group, I do Dungeons and & Dragons, and that's my Saturday group. Um, and I share players in, uh, some of the players are in both groups, but my Saturday group is more of my old, um, my oldest friends that we've been uh, together playing role-playing games since high school, uh, going on 30 years now, and, wait, 35 years now, and um, so yeah, we've, uh, we've, we've, played other role-playing games, but uh, we always come back to Dungeons and & Dragons. And so trying to get them to transition to over to something like Shadow of the Demon Lord is uh, challenging uh, because, first of all, we can only get together maybe once a month. And um, secondly, um, it seems like historically games that are not Dungeons & Dragons don't seem to draw them in. So if I say we're playing D&D, I can almost guarantee that they'll all show up. If I'm playing some other game, then I may get some of them show up and some of them may not show up because the interest just isn't there. So D&D is a certain draw for my team and I or for my Saturday group. And so I have a feeling that I'm not the only person in that, uh, in that uh, situation. So I wanted to do a D&D to, or I want to do a video to talk about how, if you are in a situation where you're running D&D, but you would really rather be running Shadow of the Demon Lord, how you can make your D&D game more like Shadow of the Demon Lord. And these are just, just suggestions and with a, um, uh, a big disclaimer that uh, I have not tested any of this out. This is all theory. Sounds good to me on paper, um, but uh, for the most part, my D and D game, I pretty much play uh, out of the book, um, rules as written, uh, with very very few house rules. But um, I don't see why the suggestions that I'm making in this video couldn't be incorporated into a D and D game. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing all of them, uh, simply because that would essentially you would be turning your D and D game into a Shadow of the Demon Lord game. But I would, uh, I, I would, wouldn't think that uh, incorporating, um, you know, a couple of them would have that much of an impact on your game. Uh, some more than others, uh, which we'll get to as we get into each one of these. All right, so um, let's see what I am talking about here. So the first thing that I would suggest is the initiative system. So as you know, in D&D, the initiative system has really not changed much since third edition. Uh, you pretty much um, have your players roll a d20 and add their dexterity modifier to determine what order of initiative they go in. And then you as a dungeon master would do the same for the opponents. And then you start at the top and work your way down. Um, and this works fine for initiative, but the problem that you run into, and I actually ran into this problem uh, just, a, just a few, um, just uh, actually the last time we played D&D, &D, which was a couple weeks ago, um, I ran into the problem where pretty much we were in a position or the players were in a position, the characters were in a position where they really couldn't get to the opponents 
on their initiative. So they ended up having to uh, ready an action. And ready an action is kind of a gamble because if the uh, opponent doesn't do the trigger that you're specifying, then you pretty much waste a, waste a round. And that's exactly what happened. We had a, uh, a situation where the, uh, the characters were in a pretty tight little area. The opponents were a good distance away from them. The opponents' initiatives were after the player initiatives. And um, it was, uh, it was a, it just a problem because the, the players wanted to get up there and do something, but they couldn't reach the opponent, so they had to ready an action, and the opponents really couldn't get to the players that round because they were too far away. So it was just one of those things that it just didn't work out very well. So another thing that can happen with initiative is that you the players want to build off of each other's um, abilities and they want to strategize. Well, using the D&D initiative, you really can't do that very well because if you, what you're wanting to do depends on what uh, another uh, teammate wants to do, but the other teammate doesn't go until after you, then it's difficult for you to plan that out because then you have to ready an action. The trigger is going to be, when well, when, when this guy... When the fighter, um, you know, goes into base contact with this, then I'm going to, you know, shoot my bow and arrow or whatever, whatever the situation may be. And it's difficult to strategize because you have to go in that initiative order. And the only thing that you can do to mitigate that is ready in action. And, you know, the, the actions of the opponents can kind of screw things up. So that is why I'm recommending the Shadow of the Demon Lord initiative system because it allows you in your in the in the uh, fast and tow slow fa fast and tow fast and slow turn um, framework to strategize. So if you are wanting to do something that is uh, complicated and it involves other teammates and you would go on a slow turn and then you just decide who goes first and you know that you're always going to be able to act first because the monsters always go after the players unless of course the monsters choose a fast action uh, in which case they would go before any uh, slow action players would go but still the potential for strategi strategizing is greater when you're using the Shadow of the Demon Lord initiative system. So that's one thing that I would recommend changing. Now, a bit of caution if you do incorporate initiative, the Shadow of the Demon Lord initiative system, uh, and that is that you would have to replace legendary actions with the epic adversary ability. And that's because uh, legendary actions are kind of built to... Um, to go off of well, legendary actions and layer actions, I should say, uh, are kind of built off, uh, built off of the D and D initiative system. So, I mean, you can kind of use legendary actions as is because that um, allows you to use a legendary action after the action of another character. Uh, so that could still apply, uh, and that's actually what the epic adversary ability is. But when you're starting to incorporate layer actions. Uh, layer actions actually occur at a specific point in the initiative in the uh, initiative order, and so you would have to change up layer actions to fit into the fast turn slow turn model of uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. So that's one thing that you would have to uh, take into consideration. Um, but uh, it, 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 another thing that you would need to consider is that legendary actions you get um, so many of legendary actions pretty much every round whereas with epic adversary you have to roll to determine how many actions you actually get how many additional actions your um your epic adversary gets um, for that particular round so um, it can be a little bit more swingy using epic adversary because one round they may only have one extra action the next round they may have three extra actions so um, there are those things to consider, but uh, I still think it's w well worth the attempt if you want to build a little bit more um, team synergy and uh, strategizing into your initiative system. All right, next thing I would recommend 
is replacing the advantage and disadvantage with boons and banes. Now, one thing that I have always had a problem with in Dungeons and Dragons is that advantage and disadvantage is either too good or it's too bad. And what I mean by that is that when you are rolling 2d20, the chances are good that one of your rolls is going to be high and one of your rolls is going to be low. Now, you could always get two low rolls or you could always get two high rolls, but there, I think there is, and I don't know the math behind it, but I think there is a pretty darn good chance, from my experience anyway, from what I've seen, when you have advantage, chances are that that character is going to hit uh, or is going to succeed with whatever uh, they have advantage on, whether it's a uh, attack roll or whether it's a saving throw or whatever. <clears throat> Now, that's great if it's just one roll, but when you get higher in levels, it seems like they have more and more abilities that grant them or grant their uh, companions um, advantages and also, and worse, grant disadvantage to their opponents. So it seems like every round, every just about every character has advantage and just about every bad guy has disadvantage, especially if you're only doing a, a boss encounter with one big boss. Uh, they're, you pretty much count on their being th th your boss being at disadvantage pretty much every round. Um, so that bugs me because advantage and disadvantage is just, is just too good or it's too bad. And I much prefer the boon and bane system of Shadow of the Demon Lord simply because you can gauge how good or bad that um, will apply to your monster uh, or to your player or to your character, I should say, by the number of boons and banes that are applied. But you always know that the worst that it can get is that the for from a boon standpoint, the best number they can get is a six to add to their d20 roll. So the you know, the, from the die roll plus a boon of six, the best roll that they will get is a 26, which is a pretty good roll. For Banes, the worst roll that they will get is a six, a minus six. So D20 minus six. So all you're doing by adding more boons or more Banes is increasing the likelihood of them getting that extreme number on that d6 so uh you know either a six on a boon or a six on a bane and but the end result is always always going to be a number one through six that's added to your d20 roll so <clears throat> where the uh, boons and banes uh are a little bit more predictable um advantage or disadvantage i think just throws a wrench into uh combat especially at higher levels as i mentioned <clears throat> so I would say that um, this would be definitely worth trying out in your D&D game. All you really need to do is replace advantage and disadvantage with boons and banes. And so if you are, um, you know, if, if your player has an ability that uh, grants an, uh, one of their companions advantage or it grants uh, or imposes a disadvantage on a, an opponent, then, you know, you would just add a boon or a bane instead. So instead of rolling 2d20, you just the uh, character would roll a d20 and a d6 for a boon and, you know, add them together instead of rolling 2d20 and taking the higher of the two rolls. Now, some might complain that, yeah, there's math involved, but you know what? You're already doing math anyway because you have to add your proficiency, proficiency modifier um, and your strength modifier to your attack roll or your agility modifier, but you're, you're already doing addition so and subtraction. So, you know, this isn't any harder than what you're already doing. So I call bullshit on that complaint. Suck it up. You're a grown up. You went through school. Uh, you can deal with math. So that's that. All right. So the next thing I would recommend is adding corruption to your game. Now, why do I suggest this? Well, I had a situation I think a couple of sessions ago where the characters in my game decided, well, they had uh, raided a, um, uh, a stronghold of their opponent 
and they had to fight their way in. So they fought, initially they fought a dragon at the door that was guarding the entry, and then they fought a couple of devils that were uh, on the inside of the stronghold entrance. And then they, by doing these uh, two combats, they alerted the rest of the stronghold, which drew a bunch of those um, uh, creatures out. And so there was a lot of upfront combat. So once all that was done, they had depleted a lot of their resources. So they wanted to go in to the barracks where all these things came out of uh, that was now vacated and they wanted to rest. Well, the problem with that is adjacent to the barracks was a torture chamber. And inside the torture chamber, there was uh, a couple of people being tortured. And the characters and you know when i described this you know i I told them okay yeah you're in this uh, you're in the barracks and you're getting ready to sit down well all of a sudden you hear a um a muffled sound coming from the door at the end of this room and it sounds a lot like um screams of agony and the characters went to the door and listened and confirmed and yeah somebody's being tortured back there or somebody at least is in extreme duress and the uh, one of the characters wanted to go in and, and uh, you know investigate and find out who's being you know tortured and you know if they could save them. Uh, but another character who happened to be the uh, the tank, uh, he was adamant that they were going to rest first, and they wanted to do a long rest, so they were going to be there in there eight hours, and you know they fought back and forth. Uh, I don't allow in a part of conflicts in my game, so there was no chance that they were going to actually fight it out. Um, but uh, they definitely had an argument, and the tank basically convinced the rest of the party to rest uh, before going and investigating. So the party spent eight hours in this room adjacent to a torture chamber listening to the agonizing screams and cries uh, ha- happening right next door. Um, I really had no way of a- applying any consequence to that decision. That was just, that was a sh- that was a dick move um, by that party of characters that were supposed to be heroes, and yet these heroes allowed whoever was next door be- to be tortured for eight hours before they finally woke up, dusted themselves off, did, you know, a few stretches and went in there and, you know, saved the, uh, the people being tortured in a shadow of the demon Lord game that would have earned corruption. So that is why I think you need to add corruption to your D and D game to ensure that your characters don't become the villains that they are supposed to be saving the world from. Um, D&D is a heroic game, whereas Shadow of the Demon Lord is less so. It is Shadow of the Demon Lord assumes that your character is not the best uh, person in the world. They are already, um, you know, the, the Shadow of the Demon Lord character is already suffering from the effects of the uh, the shadows that the uh, that's being cast over the world that's causing the world to uh, to literally um, implode. Uh, well, not literally implode, but you know, it, it, it tw- head towards its its apocalypse. Um, so, you know, the the characters are grittier, dirtier, and their morals are not uh, exactly um, pure. That is understood in a Shadow of the Demon Lord game. Not so in D&D. D&D is supposed to be a heroic game. And I know you can play D&D however you want to, but it is a heroic fantasy game by default, unless you change it. And so your D&D heroes should be heroes, um, for the most part. And introducing corruption really helps remind them that there are consequences for acting in a not heroic or in a villainous manner. So that is, that is my recommendation for um, corruption. The next thing I want to talk about and possibly recommend is death saves versus fate rolls. So as you know, in Dungeons and Dragons, when your character's hit points are dropped to zero, 
you start making death saves. The character goes unconscious, and every round they make a death save. If they succeed on three uh, death saves in a row, then they uh, become stable, and they're no longer dying. If they fail three death saves, uh, or actually the... Um, uh, the death saves don't have to be succeeded three times in a row. It's just three times. Um, and then if the death saves uh, fail three times, um, the character dies. So in Shadow of the Demon Lord, you got fate rolls. Now what happens in Shadow is that when your damage equals your health, then you, you become disabled um, and you start making fate rolls. Now, fate rolls basically is kind of an intermediate state between being alive and functional and dying. So you're kind of you're kind of in the middle here, where when you're making your fate rolls, you're not quite dying, but you're not able to get up and be um, productive. Um, you're kind of figuring out which way you're going to go. So you roll a d6, and if you roll a six, then you gain a health. You gain, you uh, regain, or you you um, uh, you heal one damage, and that enables you to wake up and to taking actions. You become impaired, but you are still functional at that point. Uh, if you roll a one on your fate roll, then you start dying. And then you continue your fate rolls to see if you're going to die or if you uh, progressively get better from that uh, from that stage. Um, so fate rolls can be a little bit better than death saves in that uh, you do have that intermediate state. And as long as you're not rolling a one when you're doing your uh, D6 rolls, then you can... Um, you know, not necessarily worry about dying after three strikes, but it can also be pretty brutal because if you're doing fate rolls and your first fate roll is a one, and then while you're dying, your second fate roll is a one, uh, you can die from two rolls versus three. So it can be better, can also be worse, just depending on sh how shitty you roll. So, um, you know, this one is kind of... Um, you, you just have to kind of incorporate it into your game to see if you like if your players like it better than death saves or if they prefer death saves. Um, I prefer fate rolls personally, um, but that is because you can also use fortune uh, to help, and um, and I know you can use. Um, inspiration for death saves, but fortune is a little bit better. And I'll get to that here in a minute. Um, so anyway, death saves versus fate rolls. And the next thing I want to talk about as a potential uh, addition to your D&D game is saving throws versus challenge rolls. Now, one thing that always bothers me with saving throws and ability checks is that um, they're basically the same thing. A saving throw is essentially an ability check that has your proficiency modifier added to um, two of your ability scores. So, you know, when you're setting up your character, you choose two of your ability scores um, to be your saving throw um, abilities. And so whenever you have a, um, uh, a, a um, an ability check or a saving throw that applies to that particular ability score, then you add your proficiency modifier to that ability score. Um, so it's basically the same thing. Uh, challenge rolls just kind of makes it all the same thing. I mean, it, it is all an ability check. Um, you roll your d20, you add your ability modifier, and you try to reach a static difficulty number. Um, the static difficulty number is what makes Shadow of the Demon Lord easier to DM than... Um, saving throws in D&D because saving throws in D&Ds require the DM to set a difficulty class or a DC. And that means every time that there is a, a challenge that they have to overcome, then I as a dungeon master have to gauge how difficult that challenge is from a scale that starts at 5 and culminates at 30. 
So there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six variations of difficulties. Uh, and that's if you want to go in stages of five. You can actually break that down into stages of one if you want. So you can have a difficulty class of 12 or you can have a difficulty class of 17 uh, if you choose to do that. I try to keep mine in stages of five um, because it's easier for me to do that. Um, but even so, it's still a pain in the ass for me to, every time to have to figure out, okay, well, let's see, I guess this is a, I guess this is hard. So let's make it a DC 20. Um, or this is kind of maybe hard. So let's make it a DC 15. And that, for, you know, it's just too much thinking for a dungeon master that always has, already has way too much, um, way too many things that you have to figure out and to process while you're running a game. So I like challenge rolls because they're simple. Always DC, uh, or the, the, the target number is always 10, period. The variable is the boons and banes. And I can throw boons and banes out left and right and not really care because, again, the, the best and the worst that they will get is a number one through six. No matter how many boons I throw on them or how many banes I throw on them, the best or worst that they can get is a one or a six. So, you know, I can say, yeah, this is, a, uh, this is an iron door. It's, um, you know, it's pretty tough. So, uh, you know, you're going to have to make a, cha a strength challenge roll uh, with three, three banes. You know, I don't know if three banes is... Uh, too much or too little, but I don't care because I can throw out three banes and it doesn't matter because the best or worst they can get is a pretty defined uh, number. Whereas setting a DC of 25 for an iron door or whatever, um, you know, all with all the different modifiers that players get from um, class class abilities from their ability scores from magic items you know you have no idea w whether that character is going to be able to hit a dc 25 you're just setting it and it could be literally an impossible number for them to reach um, which means that you may have set up a scenario where they need to get through this door however you set the dc too high so now they're not going to be able to get through the door and you come to an impasse so yeah i've done that before so that is why I prefer cha um, challenge rolls to uh, saving throws or ability um, ch uh, ability checks in D and D, mostly because of that challenge roll static um, difficulty number target number that you're trying to reach. Now, one thing I would recommend, though, if you're going to change up from saving throws to challenge rolls. Um, you will want to look at that proficiency bonus that you get in D&D because that is a pretty darn good number, especially at higher numbers or at higher levels. Um, so every four or five levels, they get a, a boost to their proficiency bonus. And that can really throw a wrench into the challenge rolls, making that difficulty target of 10 a uh, piece of cake by the time they get into higher, uh, higher levels. Uh, because you know, I, I believe that the cap on um, the the uh, proficiency bonus is a plus six. You know, a plus six. You know, you're already uh, uh, you know a good way to hitting that ten without even applying your ability modifier, um, which will probably get you there automatically without you even having to make a roll. So one thing you may want to consider if you're thinking about using challenge rolls is you may want to also consider changing the proficiency bonus to an optional rule that's in the Dungeon Master's Guide, which is a proficiency roll. So instead of getting a static um, proficiency bonus, they would roll a proficiency die um, to determine what number to add for their proficiency. Um, so the Dungeon Master Guide has a, the optional rule in it. And I forget exactly what the proficiency die uh, is. I believe it starts with, here it is. Um, so levels one through four, you normally get a proficiency bonus of plus two, but in, you could use a proficiency die instead which means that they have to roll a 1d4 
along with their 1D20, add the proficiency die number to the D20 roll, and that is the proficiency bonus that they get for that roll. So you can get anything from a plus one to a plus four on a roll from levels one through four. And then, of course, um, 17th through 20th level, where you get a plus six proficiency bonus, um, the proficiency die is 1D12, which can make it much swingier uh, because you're adding either a plus one or a plus 12 uh, to the roll. So this one is a little, probably a little bit more difficult to incorporate in D&D. I think it can be done, but it might cause more problems than it solves. So that one I would suggest uh, you think about pretty hard before you actually make that jump. All right, so the next thing is inspiration versus fortune. Um, fortune is, I think, in my, my opinion, far better than inspiration. So for D&D, inspiration means um, you, you either have inspiration or you don't. And fortune is the same way. You either have fortune or you don't. Unless you're using a fortune variant um, or a, like a, a, uh, a, a team pool of fortune points. Um, but that's a, that, you know, that's a different topic. Um, so let's just assume right now that you either have uh, inspiration or fortune or you don't have it. Um, so with that assumption, then I would say that fortune is better because it gives you more options. Now, inspiration just means that you can choose to roll 2d20 for an attack roll or a challenge roll, or excuse me, a saving throw or an ability check and take the better of the two rolls. That can be a, uh, a good roll. You know, if you're rolling 2d20, you can get two good numbers, or you can get one bad number, one good number, or you can get two bad numbers. Um, so you're, it, you know, it's still a gamble at that point. With fortune, you are, you're given three options. Now, the first option is that you just change a failed roll into a success. So that can be an attack roll. That can be a... Um, a fate roll, that can be a challenge roll. Uh, it's up to you. Whatever you roll that, um, that D24, you can choose to use your fortune to have that roll succeed. Another option that you can use is to apply a, for, a, a fortune to one of your teammates to have them add a D6 to their roll. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Back up. Rewind. Yeah. Okay. Second option, if I can only read my own writing that's right there on the screen. Uh, the second option is you can grant two boons to uh, an attack roll or a challenge roll to another character. Um, so that's option number two for fortune. Option number three is that you can change the roll of one on a d6 to a six, which as it states right there, comes in real handy when you're making fate rolls, because if you, um, you know, become disabled and you're automatically making uh, fate, uh, fate rolls, you can use your fortune to uh, turn a roll of one, which would mean that you're starting to die, um, to a roll of six, which means that you, you know, heal a point of damage and you are functional again, somewhat. So fortune is much better than inspiration. I would definitely consider uh, making that change. <clears throat> All right, next thing. Uh, use shadows in your D&D game. Now, this doesn't mean use the monster shadows, although I do recommend that as well, because shadows uh, are horrific monsters and you should use them as much as possible. But what I am actually recommending is using an event uh, that defines your campaign that in Shadow of the Demon Lord is referred to as the shadow that the Demon Lord is casting over the world. Um, and it is defined by a specific event that is occurring um, that is causing things to happen in your world. So it's kind of a uh, mover and shaker. It is an impetus in your campaign to action, um, to to drive your, your characters towards uh, resolving a problem that is affecting the campaign world. 
Um, this can be something that is civilization ending, world destroying, or it could be something on a smaller scale like a, um, a corrupt organization that is um, using its influence to, uh, to do bad things in your town. But um, most of them are um, earth shattering, um, apocalypse causing events. Uh, and so I recommend using this in your D&D game because they're fun. Uh, and they also help to define your campaign and to give your, your, uh, your characters a purpose um, to strive towards. Uh, some of my favorite ones that I think would work well in D&D would be the Black Sun Shadow, um, the Curse of the Beastmen, uh, Demonic Incursion, Dreams of the Dead God, Infectious Madness, and Restless Dead. Um, all of them are great. I, I like all of the shadows in the book, and I actually have plans to use each of them in a campaign at some point. But uh, these are the ones I think would work particularly well in D&D. And it would help you to, um, again, build your campaign around something, a framework um, that kind of you can infuse throughout your campaign. Um, all right, so let me go ahead and move on to using Shadow of the Demon Lord monsters. Now, nothing feels more like Shadow of the Demon Lord than some of the monsters that uh, have been created just for the game. Um, I've listed some of them here. There are more out there, but um, these are the ones I, cho I choose simply because they, they really speak to a, a Shadow of the Demon Lord game to me personally. Um, Beastmen. Now, I know you have um, Beastmen in D&D, &D, but they're really not a... They're, they're really not categorized as Beastmen. They are just creatures that resemble beasts. So you have gnolls, um, and, you know, you have uh, minotaurs, you know, you have different types of beast men in D&D, &D, but they're not really a, they're not unified like they are in D&D &D, or in Shadow of the Demon Lord. In Shadow of the Demon Lord, beast men are servants of the Demon Lord. Um, they are warped by the void, um, which kind of shapes them into tools that the Demon Lord uses um, as his proxy on, uh, on, on the material world that he can't get to because of the barrier, the genie barrier that um, separates the void from the material world. So Beastman is uh, definitely a Shadow of the Demon Lord concept, and I would incorporate that into your D&D your &D game. Um, I think the closest correlation is the Knolls in D&D &D because they have a tight... Um, connection to um, demons in the abyss, but they're really tied to one specific demon, uh, Yinogu. I never knew how to say that demon lord's name, but you know, he's the demon lord of um, of gnolls. And um, I never dug him. And for some reason, he never really uh, did anything for me. So I would use Beastmen more in line with serving all demons. Um, but that's just me. Speaking of demons, uh, the demons from uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord are different than demons from D&D. &D. Demons in D from D&D &D are pretty defined in shape and form and power. Whereas demons in Shadow of the Demon Lord are formed in the material world from things in the environment to form a twisted, horrific, nightmarish, uh, conglomeration of these things in the environment. Sure, you can have your typical Balrog looking demon show up in Shadow of the Demon Lord, but most of the time a demon in Shadow of the Demon Lord is going to look like uh, a mish mishmash of different shit thrown together uh, from the immediate surroundings. So if you have a demon materialize in a, um, in a barn, then it's going to be part um, part swine, part pitchfork, part, um, uh, what the hell else is in a barn? Uh, sickle. Um, it's going to have all these farm implements and farm animals incorporated into its, its form and created to be as horrific as, as these various things can be when thrown together. Um, now you can even go 
apeshit crazy with putting a demon together by drawing things from not necessarily just the environment, but the world. So if you have chainsaws in your world, you can say that this demon draws from um, the um, the engineers guild in um, in Lidge and um, you know creates a chainsaw arm um, and then has a shotgun arm and then has you know a um, um, you know some kind of metallic um, chomping mouth or some shit like that. Um, you can you, your imagination is free to create the most horrific thing that you can with the shadow demon lord demon. Um, now, what is more defined are demon princes, and demon princes are are akin to the demon lords in um, uh, in D and D, um, but or I guess they're called princes in D and D too. But uh, at any rate, the the demon princes in Shadow the Demon Lord uh, are a little bit more defined. You got the Destroyer of Worlds. Um, I forget the name of the other two off the top of my head, but um, they do have a certain shape that they they take when they materialize, um, but they are freaking badass uh, monsters and uh, e easily equal to an Orcus um, in terms of um, challenge to your high-level characters. Um, all right, the next monster I would recommend are Broodlings. They are creepy uh, swarm monsters that can take a uh, humanoid shape. Um, the Dread Mother, I love the Dread Mother. Uh, these monsters fly around and they um, in, use their tongue to inject eggs into your uh, into your characters, uh, which later burst out uh, alien style from um, from your character's chest. Good, great stuff. Uh, Ghastly Chorus is pretty creepy and cool. You know, you got the faces of uh, various humanoids sewn together, and they it crawls out in this tapestry. Uh, uh, that talks. Yeah, it's uh, very creepy. Harvesters are definitely a, D a uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord uh, icon. I uh, would definitely use those. Uh, a hood. Hoods are pretty creepy. You know, the, the these things that look like dwarves, but when you draw their head back, they got this dome for a head. They have these uh, lamprey type eel things in swimming around this uh, greenish liquid inside. Uh, muttering maw. Uh, that's basically just a big chomping mouth. Um, that uh, walks around eating everything. Uh, Oculus is this uh, slime with the, the big red eye in the middle. Um, Horned Ogre is definitely a uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord icon. Uh, Reens, I believe, are pretty um, specific to Shadow of the Demon Lord. Void Larva. And then finally, I say zombies, even though zombies are included in D&D. Uh, &D, uh, your typical D&D zombie doesn't really... Uh, your typical D&D zombie is more like an animated dead in Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, the, the Shadow of the Demon Lord zombie is more of what you would expect to find in a zombie apocalypse um, movie where the zombie's bite is infectious and can actually cr um, cause your characters to turn into zombies. So that's why I prefer the uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord zombie over a D&D um, &D zombie. So definitely use Shadow of the Demon Lord monsters in your game to make it feel more like Shadow of the Demon Lord. Also, introduce insanity into your D&D game. Now, there's already a variant in the DMG, um, an optional rule for incorporating insanity, but uh, I prefer the Shadow of the Demon Lord version uh, simply because the rule in the DMG is to actually have and a, a separate ability score called Sanity. And you make saving throws off of that to determine whether or not uh, your character is affected by, you know, something that's scary. That's a little bit too complicated for me. I prefer the, uh, the Sanity Point uh, accumulation system that is used in uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. That way, you you know how many points of s insanity you are accumulating, and you know that at a certain point it is going to affect your character negatively because uh, once it hits your your will, or in d d it would be your wisdom score, then um, you, you, you risk going insane, permanently insane, or... Um, at the very least, uh, you know, getting a short-term madness. Um, 
but at any rate, I would say that, um, you know, the Shadow of the Demon Lord version is, is my preference uh, for incorporating insanity into your D&D game. However, I think it needs uh, to be done because there are monsters in D&D that should invoke um, horror and should stretch and sometimes break your character's sanity, especially when you're dealing with far realm creatures like uh, mind flayers. Um, those things are just horrific, especially if they, if your, if your characters witness a mind flayer actually suck the brain out of one of their, um, one of their companions, uh, or even from an NPC that should break somebody with, you know, a weak, um, uh, a weak, uh, a weak will. And, um, you know, that would be a way for your, uh, your DM to be able to challenge, um, your tanks that pump all of their resources into their physical attributes at the expense of their mental attributes. And so their, um, uh, what's it called? Their dump stat is their wisdom, um, which makes them pretty susceptible to insanity. So that is a, uh, that is something to consider DMs when you want to challenge your tanks in your game. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. And we are getting close to the end here, so stick with me. All right, use the core campaign world. So I think out of everything, the campaign world that was built for Shadow of the Demon Lord really conveys the feel of Shadow of the Demon Lord. It is a world that was an empire that was built off of the back of another empire that was built off the back of another empire, all of which were corrupt, and the thus the world is corrupt, and it's just a, a dirty, low-down, gritty place to start with. That's Shadow of the Demon Lord in a nutshell. So use Earth. It's got a rich history. It's got tons of lore, uh, lots of things to draw from, and it's something that your, care, your, your players aren't already familiar with. Uh, if you have old school players are probably already familiar with Greyhawk, they're probably familiar with the Forgotten Realms, maybe even Dark Sun, uh, the world of Athos, and, um, you know, the other campaign worlds that have been used for D&D for, you know, 40, 40 plus years. This may be a breath of fresh air for them, um, even though the air is kind of tainted on Earth. Um, it, uh, it would still be a world that they're not familiar with. So I would, I would definitely recommend using earth. It's one of my favorite, uh, campaign worlds, but there's, there's tons of campaign worlds out there. So you don't have to use earth. Uh, you know, you could use Midgard. Uh, that's fairly, uh, that's a fairly new world. Uh, not really. It's been around for about 20 years, but anyway, I mean, there are plenty of campaign worlds that you could use, but, uh, I would really recommend using the, uh, the shadow of the demon Lord campaign world. If you want it to feel like shadow of the demon Lord. All right, and the next one is the 11 session campaign. So another way to get the Shadow of the Demon Lord feel, especially if you don't have a lot of time to play D&D and you can only get together a few times a year, is to try the 11 session campaign. Basically what that does is it, uh, it starts your campaign at level zero and it ends your campaign at level 10. So there's 11 level spread and each session that you play encompasses one level of play. So that also forces you as the DM to create a session that can be played in that one uh, or to create a, uh, uh, a game that can be played in that one session, start to finish. So you have to decide, you know, if you only have three hours to play, you know, what can, what story can you craft? that can you can start and that you can reasonably finish in that three hour session you know same thing if you got a six hour session you can do more things it just depends on how much time you have to devote to that session but you still need to be able to craft your session around the time frame that you have so that you can finish it in that session because what you're doing it with an 11 session campaign is you are taking the career of the this group of heroes uh, and you are shining a spotlight on a moment in time where something important happens. So this could be a, th this 11 session campaign could be over the course of, you know, 30 years 
where you start at zero level when they're teenagers and you end at 10th level when they're in their 50s or 60s and you know they're old as fuck um, still trying to um, you know uh, save the world um, a little bit at a time but each of those sessions could happen every five years uh, with a five-year spread so between sessions um, in world so that is what the 11 session campaign is it, it it is rather than going day to day in a campaign where you might uh from one session you might be in town and you know get the the seeds for an adventure and then the next session you actually go on the adventure and then the next session you continue that adventure and then maybe in the next session you finish that adventure uh, so over the course of four sessions you really just did one adventure um, scenario. Well, I may have a bunch of scenarios in there, but still, the, you did one adventure uh, over the course of four sessions. You're compressing all of that into one session, um, and you're really kind of starting in media res. So you're starting your 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 session uh, with the action already going, and your your characters already in the midst of things, and you just go from there until you end the session, and then they level up. Um, and then your next session could be five years later. Five years later, uh, you guys have been you know, roaming the world and doing things. You can even ro do um, uh, several roles on the, um, the the downtime tables in the uh, for forbidden uh, forbidden rule supplement that uh, I still don't have down here. Um, but uh, anyway, I've not successfully done the eleven session campaign. It is one of my goals. I want to do this. But um, I am just too ingrained in my ways in doing the session to session to session um, way of doing things as I have for like the last 35 years. So it is a habit that I have yet to break, but I do plan on doing that because I love the concept of being able to play an entire campaign in 11 sessions. And I am going to do that one of these days. Uh, so I recommend if you want to do that for your D&D game, incorporate this 11 session campaign. All right. So I have talked about 11 different ways of making your D&D game into uh, more like a Shadow of the Demon Lord game. But you can throw all of that out if it is too much of an impact or it will cause your players too much grief uh, to do any of the aforementioned um, recommendations. Uh, if you do nothing else to make your game more like Shadow of the Demon Lord, then do this. Use the Max Press supplements. Now, Max Press is an imprint that uh, Robert Schwab created specifically for creating Dungeons & Dragons uh, content. And the first couple of things that he created were things that take concepts from Shadow of the Demon Lord game and... Um, makes and it makes an uh a version of that for dungeons and dragons so the first one i believe it was the first one that came out was uh the blasphemies of boar walsh and what that does is it incorporates um new spells into um D, D that are based off a of shadow of the demon lord spells and it's of course modified to fit the D, &D system uh, so you'll get some of the uh, spells that feel like or are based off of the Shadow of the Demon Lord spells. And uh, some of them are great. So I definitely recommend, or they're all great, but uh, some of them are really great. So I would recommend using the Blasphemies of Borb Walsh, um, most definitely right away if you haven't already incorporated that. Uh, the next thing would be Forbidden Knowledge, which in introduces... Um, some new arcane traditions to your D&D game. Uh, the ones that it includes are uh, the Alienist. What I love about the Alienist is that there's a feature, a class feature that, um, uh, that causes a uh, sentient tumor to grow on the character, uh, which, you know, you, that just all kinds of hilarity can come out of that in your game, I'm sure. It would in my group. Um, demonology, mind bondage, occultism, shadowmancy, summoning, witchcraft, uh, and then there are new spells to fit each of those traditions. So this is uh, definitely a great way to uh, to add some Shadow of the Demon Lord into your D&D game. And then finally, there is a Demonic Excretions uh, supplement that uh, introduces some ooze monsters that are definitely Shadow of the Demon Lord um, um, versions of D&D uh, monsters. 
D&D versions of Shadow of the Demon, Lord of Monsters, uh, is what I meant to say. Okay, that, my friends, uh, is it for my recommendations on how to make your D&D game uh, more like Shadow of the Demon Lord. Now, um, you can... Um, you can disagree to all of these things if you like. If you want to keep your D&D game as your D&D game, that is great. You do you. Um, I'm just saying, if you really wish your D&D game was more like Shadow of the Demon Lord, think about some of these things. I do all the time. Um, now, have I actually incorporated these things in my D&D game? I have not, because I actually tried Shadow of the Demon Lord with my D&D group, and they didn't, it didn't take. Um, so, like I said, they are too ingrained in Dungeons and Dragons to to change, and I'm sure many of your, your many of your groups are uh, in a similar situation, and that's fine. But if you have some uh, some some groups that are kind of on the borderline, but they're not willing to take the leap, then maybe incorporate some of these things into your D and D game, make it a little bit more like Shadow, and uh, that might help them, you know, make this make the switch. Uh, if not. Maybe it'll help you manage your D&D game uh, by using some rules that you like in, or prefer in Shadow of the Demon Lord um, over what is available in D&D. Okay, I am going to end the video here. Once again, I appreciate you watching. Uh, if you have any um, suggestions of your own on how to make your D&D game more like Shadow of the Demon Lord, feel free to put it in the comments section of my video. Uh, also, hit the like button if you like uh, my content. Um, it helps to increase, increase the um, uh, visibility in Shadow the Demon Lord so that if somebody, or in YouTube, so if, it, if somebody is doing a, a search for Shadow the Demon Lord content, it's more likely that one of my videos will come up, um, which is, of course, what I want because uh, my videos are geared towards trying to bring people into the game and it's not quite as much... Um, you know, actual play or, um, or interviews or things like that, which are great to watch too, but there's a lot of those out there already. And I enjoy videos that are more about, uh, talking about the game, talking about the very aspects of the game and just having conversations with your, uh, with your, with your virtual buddies out there, uh, one-sided of course, but still a conversation with your virtual buddies about, uh, the game that you love. So, uh, that's what my videos are all about. And I do encourage you to uh, interact with me in the comments section. If you have, um, uh, differing opinions, or if you have uh, anything that you'd like to add to my commentary. Um, also, one last thing I would like to add before I wrap this video up, and that is this is episode 45, which means that we are closing in on episode 50, which is a, uh, uh, a milestone for me. Never thought I would hit 50 episodes. Um, I thought I pretty much quit long before this. But uh, here I am, still going, and I've got a list of things I still want to cover. Um, so I've yet uh, to, I, I still have a lot of content yet um, to, uh, to make videos on. So I think it's going to go for a little while longer. Uh, but I do want to do something special for my 50th episode. And so I'm, I'm thinking about doing a, um, either a, a live stream um, one shot game where I DM. Uh, a group of people from the community. Um, and of course, I've solicited on the, the Facebook group. I've also uh, thrown, thrown out a solicitation on the, um, uh, on the two uh, Discord channels um, or servers that uh, are Shadow the Demon Lord um, centric. And so um, I hope to draw from the sources a core group of people that I can use for a one shot. Uh, for my 50th episode. Now, I've never live streamed before, so I don't know how to do that. I'm going to have to educate myself. Uh, and I also need to get a group of people that I can uh, get together on a certain day and time to do the live stream. So that's why I'm throwing out the solicitations right now so I can get a big pool to draw from. Uh, so if I have to narrow it down to a specific date and time, uh, that hopefully if there's a big enough pool, enough of you will fit into that uh, or be able to fit into your schedules that specific uh, time, date and time, so that we can record a session. So, um, you know, think about it. If you would like to um, participate in something like that, then feel free to reach out to me either in the comments section of this video or in the Facebook group uh, or in one of the Discord channels and uh, let me know. Um, 
So with that, thank you all for watching my videos, and I will catch you next time. So hail to the Demon Lord, and I'm checking out. See ya!